Now, my name is Matt McGew. I'm a psychologist at the University of Minnesota. Um, I want to thank Aldo for letting me come. And I'm going to actually talk about work I'm doing with Aldo. Um, uh, two caveats before I begin. First, I, Aldo asked me to talk about population studies. I'm going to talk about a population study, the study that we do in Minnesota. Um, how do I? Ah. Okay. Um, and it has the advantage that I'm familiar with it. I, I think it's also a large population study, and at least for a U.S. state, it's probably reasonably representative. This, for about 25 years, um, my colleagues and I have been involved in longitudinal research at Minnesota, where the sampling unit is a nuclear family, a pair of adolescents and their parents. And the adolescents we've followed up for 20 years, in, in some cases, from adolescents into early adulthood with very high rates of, of participation and follow-up, about 90 percent. And the adolescents are distinguished. Some are twins, some are adopted adolescents, some are full biological siblings. So I'm going to talk about one study, and hopefully it's representative, but you'll let me know if not. And the other caveat I should begin with is I'm probably going to, I actually only have a very, two simple messages, and I, sus I, I, I fe maybe fear, I don't really care, that most of you already know this, and so I don't really need to be here. But um, because a lot of you have done the work that I'm going to talk about with our sample. And I guess the two points I want to make are these. One is that if you look at social achievements, cognitive variables are important, but they may not be the most important variables. And that's definitely true in our sample. So that's the first point. And the second point is that social achievements may be unlike other behavioral genetic phenotypes. Uh, the first speaker talked about, for most behavioral genetic phenotypes, what we would call the shared family environment is not very important. That's certainly true for mental illness, for IQ, at least in adulthood, and for personality. But I think it's rather different for social achievement. So those are kind of the two bottom lines I want to make, that non-cognitive are perhaps more important than cognitive variables when thinking about social achievements. And again, other people have done a lot more work on that than I have. And then secondly, that the environment here is very important. I know there's a, a conference on genetics, but that, that things aggregate in families because of the environment. So I have three things I'll talk about. First is just that aggregation. This, um, these are our twin samples, and the patterns, of, I'm going to focus just on college graduation. It's, it's a reasonable social achievement. Um, and the data in Minnesota, although we're all above average in Minnesota, it, it look kind of like the U.S. Census, except with a couple exceptions. One is, it looks like the U.S. Census in the fact that the rates of college graduation are higher in the offspring generation than the parent generation, so there's these cohort effects. And secondly, the, the cohort effect is greater for women than men, so now more women are graduating from college than men. Um, this is the census data down here. Where, where it's atypical is we have a higher graduation rate in Minnesota than in the U.S. This is just the, actually, the tetrachoric correlations uh, for graduating from college in this large sample. And I'll point out a couple things. One is that the MZ correlation is phenomenally high, um, and actually not that much higher than the Dizagotic twin correlation. And again, these are fairly reasonable samples. Assortative mating, and Aldo showed this before, is also extremely high for educational attainment. And of course, the existence of assortative mating would drive up the genetic resemblance between Dizagotic twins. So you need to take that into account, and we did in just a simple biometrical modeling of this data. And if you look at it in our sample, and I think this is probably fairly representative of what people find for educational attainment, is it's moderately to modestly heritable. But there's a very strong familial environmental effect, and that's really atypical for most behavioral genetic traits. The things seem to be going on in the families that don't have to do with genetics. That isn't true of mental illness, I don't think, nor is it true of personality. It may not be all that true of cognitive ability. So that's one, I think, important point I'd like to try to make. The second thing is the, this, the economists use the term hard skills, soft skills, which I kind of like now. I, 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 really, cognitive ability versus non-cognitive ability, but okay, I'm here talking with the economists. I'll use your terms. So in our data, uh, this is, I'm going to use data that we assessed at age 17. We have essentially IQ as a hard skill. That's the one, but it's a pretty good measure of IQ. And then we have various personality factors, including self-control, a measure of how academically motivated the student is, 
and also a measure of just how much they break the rules externalized, the extent to which they're disinhibited. And those are the six predictors I'm going to look at. And not surprisingly, they all predict subsequently. So these were assessed when they're high school seniors. Subsequently predict whether or not by age 25 they completed college. And here's the odds ratio for the standardized, if, if these variables are standard on a standardized metric. And also sex, which of course isn't standardized. But the point being is that all of them are significantly related to completing college. And actually the, the strongest predictor is how academically motivated the student was in, in his or her senior year of high school. But also externalizing psychopathology is a very powerful predictor. And what's more is that the cognitive ability is not very correlated with these non-cognitive factors. So that if you simultaneously fit all these, uh, you don't have much effect on the, most of the odds ratios. Both cognitive ability and these factors remain significant. So my second point is that non-cognitive abilities are perhaps more important in thinking about social achievements, at least this one, and actually other data we have would suggest other ones as well, um, than cognitive ability, although cognitive ability is certainly important. One of the unique things about our sample is we do have the parents, and we've measured the parents on five of those six factors. And so we can ask about mobility relative to the parents. In this case, mobility is, do you have a college grad, a degree versus your parents having a college degree? Because of the cohort effect, there's more upward mobility than downward mobility, although that's really true for the women and not so much the men. Right? They're both going up and down about the same rate. But it can ask whether or not, if we talk about really mobility within a family, what allows a child to move up? versus move down in terms of those factors that predict at the individual level in the total population, do they also predict within the family? And the answer to that is, in general, yes. Um, so I'll just explain one of these and then highlight the other. So this is cognitive ability. This is the standardized mean difference between the average parent IQ and the offspring's IQ if the offspring moved down relative to the parents in terms of their education versus moved up. And if, if they move down, then they have a lower IQ on average than their parents. Then they move up, they have a higher IQ. If they move down, they have more externalizing psychopathology than their parents have externalizing psychopathology. If they move up, they have lower levels of externalizing psychopathology. If they move, if they move down, up, or I'm sorry, up, they're less neurotic than their parents, but not so much if they move down more self-control if they're moving down than their parents. So the same factors that predict at the individual level actually predict the dynamics within families. Individuals move up relative to their parents if they're brighter than their parents, if they're less neurotic than their parents, and if they're more self-controlled than their parents. They will move down relative to the parents if they are at the other extreme relative to where their parents lie. So the last point, I 17. They're all measured at, in this case, no, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The parents are, no, the parents are assessed as adults. Personality is pretty stable, but you know, we don't know what, we, we, we don't know what the parents look like at age 17. Um, the, the one variable we couldn't measure in the parents, unfortunately, is this academic motivation variable. Because, right, they're middle-aged now, and what we really wanted to know was what they were like when they were 17 years old. But things like neuroticism and positive emotionality and self-control and externalizing behavior, it's, it's not optimal, but it's probably not completely outrageous to, to use their middle-aged values here. They evolve, yeah, but some of these things are, I mean, we can, see, uh, we can see in the offspring the extent to which, for example, personality traits are stable from high school through age 30, which is the oldest age we have the offspring. And they're pretty stable. They're not as, that's not as old as the parents, but the stability of things like pers individual differences in personality and externalizing things like that, and certainly IQ, are really pretty high by the time you hit 17. But to adjust the things like education, we know from other work models, there are educational causal effects on these traits, measured traits. I don't know what you mean by educational causal, but maybe I'll touch on that. I, I did not control for edu whose education are you controlling for? The parents? The, the, if you control for the parents' educational effect, they're still significant. 
Conversely, this doesn't really account for the, educa the education effect of the parents on the child's education. So I could control for the parents' education. And yeah, they, it, I mean, it would it, it probably very minimally affect the odds ratios here. But that, what I'm reporting isn't, is not corrected for that. The last point, um, environmental transmission within families may not be due to, to building these cognitive and non-cognitive hard and soft skills. Uh, we have adoption families. We have about 408 adoptive families in our, so this is not the twins. And I can look, there is a familial transmission of, of, of um, college attainment, both in genetically related parent offspring pairs as well as non-genetically related. These are the adoptive family. So this is, if your parents, if one or at least one of your parents went to college, this is the rate of which you went to college versus if neither of your parents. And you can see that the effect is bigger if they're genetically related. That's the genetic effect that we know exists. But there's still an effect in the adoptive families. That's an, it has to be an environmental. It's not a genetic effect. So adoptive parents, even though they're not genetically related to their offspring, if they're college educated, their offspring are more likely to be college educated. And we might think that's great if those ad college educated adoptive parents are building the skills that we think are relevant to attaining a college education. But they don't seem to be doing that. Um, this is the standardized mean difference between adopted offspring of adopted parents who didn't complete college versus did on these various skills. And you can see for things like the academic motivation, the externalizing, and the personality traits, there's no significant difference. That is, the, parents with the, co the adopted parents with a college education don't have adopted offspring, even though the adopted offspring are, going to college, are more likely to go to college than if they didn't have an education, but they're not because they have these skills. There's a kind of a marginal effect on IQ. So maybe there's something going on with IQ, but not a lot. So if it's not that, what is it? Um, maybe not surprising, I mean, my, my one gesture towards economics is what does matter is the income of the family. Um, this is the effect of income in the non-adoptive families. This is the effect in the adoptive families. So these are environmental mechanisms here. Yeah, I'm almost done. You can see that there's a, it's not as strong as in the biological families. That's the genetic effect. But even within adoptive families, the offspring are more likely, even though they don't have the skills necessarily, they're more likely to, to go to college as a function of their parents' income. So. No, but that's easy to do, and I, I actually don't. No, I, I'm just asking you huh? I'm just asking yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I actually, it's. I don't think. It could be that the. It, I mean, it's. It could be that the income effect is, or the, I, let me put it the other way. It could be that the parent education effect is just income, and that's a relevant, important question. I haven't done that. Okay, but we do have a, an environmentally transmitted effect on educational attainment. It doesn't seem to be mediated by the skills. It could be mediated by income. I, I don't think it's going to totally account for the effect just because of the magnitude of the effect here. Okay, my summary, and then I, I should be done. I'd like most behavioral tra genetic traits, at least the ones I've studied in my career, I think the traits that you're studying, and I'm still surprised you find things, Philip, on the, on the uh, it's, very, it's great, but the genetic effects are less than the ones, and you're way ahead of us, maybe because you have a larger sample. The, it's not as heritable as a lot of the traits we look at, things like educational attainment, certainly income. Um, and it, it has these environmental effects that are going on in the families as well that isn't typical of behavioral genetic traits. Intergenerational mobility, if you move up relative to your parents or move down, is really a function of the same hard and soft skills that operate at the population level. So I think it's important for dynamic. And then there are these f familial environmental factors, but at least our adoption data suggests that they may not be mediated by building these skills so much as maybe providing opportunities for the children in the family. So thank you, and hopefully I finish on that. Thank you. The, be the behavioral genetic literature. I'm not a, a one who's going to argue that you can estimate something like heritability with great precision no matter what econometric, fancy, structural, mathematical model you use, because, the, the, because humans are just too complex, human behavior is too complex. I think we can kind of get a ballpark estimate, but 
but I, I wouldn't say that the heritability of IQ you could estimate certainly to the second decimal point, maybe not even to the first. The, I think probably the reason though that Goldberg's and other critics of that era, criticisms have not endured is because they focused on a set of studies and it's really a very broad literature. So things coming out of twin studies are really replicated using a, a very different methodology in adoption studies that has its own limitations. So that's something like the heritability of personality, or the, that it is heritable, or the heritability of IQ doesn't rest on studies of twins alone. It, you also have adoption studies, you have family studies, you have children of twins studies. You have many, many different types of studies that converge on the same answer. So it, it's, it's hard to, to just, just to eliminate the literature by saying there's something wrong with twin studies. I'd have to know the specific criticism to try to respond to it. But, well, I, but I, I, can sh I can tell you that at this point, he's not cited anymore. Maybe the criticism... I don't think he ever was. I'm, okay. I'm just, yeah. oh, no, no, I think people definitely paid attention to him in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, but I don't think anymore. He actually was remarkably unworthy cited. Yeah, but maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly remember reading his papers back then. And I, you know, it's a little hard to, to, to address a criticism without knowing what the criticism is. Well, obviously, RGE got a huge amount of attention in his arguments. So what he would do is give a proof that if you made a different choice of, a, of that correlation, you get any 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 uh, calculation you had for the role of genes. Okay, so that's something I can respond to, and I think that's a very legitimate point. And remember, I'm, the, I'm, I'm asking an unfair question. I want to know why in 1979 that got less play. Than, uh, it did. The second okay, believe it or not, in 1979 yeah. I wasn't in the field, but <laughs> I got into it pretty shortly thereafter. But not, not but I, again, I think he had an impact. The thing with RGE is a very legitimate point, the, and, and it's kind of a disagreement between non-behavioral geneticists and behavioral geneticists. But it's worthwhile recognizing what behavioral geneticists will say is that there are correlations between your genes and your environment. In particular, there are correlations because we create environments that reinforce genetically inherited traits. And if we weren't able to choose those environments, for example, by going to the library or studying rather than partying on the weekend, then it wouldn't allow us to fully express our genetic traits. That's a gene environment correlation. In these behavioral genetic models, unambiguously, that type of genetic gene environment correlation goes into the heritability. I don't have any problem with that because I see the heritability as nothing more than a statistic that tells you how well you can predict individual differences on a trait from knowing differences in the genetic makeup of individuals. It doesn't tell you what the mechanism is. Other people would say, well, that just completely invalidates the heritability. It, for them, it may, I, I guess. Can I just yeah. pick up on the attempt uh, partial answer to Steve's question? Um, it, I mean, it's true that, that Goldberger made a lot of critiques, but um, I think the most important critique uh, that he made was that the heritability estimates um, don't uh, don't by themselves have policy implications. And so, for example, you know the fact that eyesight is highly heritable doesn't mean that eyeglasses can't improve eyesight. That was his example. You know, you, you know it's it's actually the same essentially as your point that you made in your presentation that, that knowing about the variance decomposition doesn't tell you that you can't shift the mean uh, and have a big effect uh, to the other factors that, that, um, that matter. And I think that that criticism did have an effect in economics. Basically, you know, Taubman, you know, economists stopped doing twin studies uh, after Taubman until David and collaborators started doing them again a few years ago. Uh, but I suspect the reason that didn't have much impact in the field of behavior genetics is because behavior geneticists are, are psycho primarily psychologists and interested in individual differences among people and weren't ultimately interested in policy per se. Uh, and so, you know, I think the, the extent that there's been an impact, there's kind of a statement among in a lot of behavior genetics papers saying that we're not, this doesn't necessarily have direct policy implications. Uh, but then, of course, when you're um, trying to argue the relevance of the work, then often you end up saying there are policy implications. So uh, I think the policy relevance is a different point. And 
And I actually did not bring this up to say economists are right in how they think. It's more, this is how many economists think, and that is you have this unobservable object called the gene environment correlation. And since, depending on how you set it, you can get a zero or a one, as it were, in the role of heritability, Goldberger's conclusion was there's no informational content. And I really wanted on the table that that's not how other you know, disciplines proceed, and so it's interesting. I would like interactions eventually to understand how you can move constructively starting with those priors. And I just want to respond to the policies that I, I, I agree with you, Dan, but I think there's some interesting insights that people get from heritability studies, and I'm just going to give one for which there again is converging evidence that if you restrict opportunity, you reduce heritability of intelligence or IQ. And there are three lines of evidence or cognitive three lines of evidence that I can think of immediately that are relevant. One is the Turkheimer effect, that, so that in impoverished environments, the heritability of IQ is very low. Secondly is data coming out of Spain that under a restrictive, it's, it's in this case educational attainment, but under a restrictive opportunities for advanced um, education, the heritability, particularly for women, of educational attainment is low. And then third, a study that was from Florida that showed if you had an, ineff which was a good measure of having an ineffective teacher, it actually, versus an, an effective teacher of reading in second grade, that the heritability of reading was much higher with when you had an effective teacher than when you had an ineffective teacher. So those, I don't think, directly translate into policy, but I think they give insights in, in, in terms of under what conditions are genetic effects maximized or minimized. I could tell you my thinking, and I, I don't know that it's representative. It's a, it's, it's kind of, as you, I'm sure you appreciate it, it's a difficult problem for behavioral genesis because it embroils us in controversy over and over again. You're behind closed doors. No, 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 no. But, and, and you're going to think that, I think the answer, if, if you're talking about group differences, the whole notion that we're all the same is, of course, nonsense. Genetically, we're, that's why we look different. Uh, there's a, in a, all the genomic data says this over and over again, we differ genetically from one another. And I think, and we know that for certain diseases that genetic factors contribute to differences in disease by, uh, as a function of ancestral background. The, 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 the difficulty with behavioral genetics, of course, is intelligence. It's not disease and not whether or not you have high blood pressure. In that case, what always stops me from thinking very much about this is the Flynn effect. And the Flynn effect, I think most people know, is IQs have been going up, when is it, three IQ points a decade? They, it, they've leveled off now, but in almost all Western societies and other societies, well. It's leveling off only in the West. Huh? It's leveling off only in the West. In, only in the West, and in others. It's depending on, you know, fluid versus crystallized intelligence. Yeah. The. Yeah, well, it's mostly on fluid. You're right about that. But, but okay, the, to finish the thought, right, our genomes, despite, I guess, what you were saying, I don't think they've changed that much. You, you were talking about 1,000 years, and here we're talking about the Flynn effect is 50 years or 40 years. Yeah, so, so our genome, we can get this massive, more than a standard deviation change that is due to something environmental. It is in our genomes. So given that, what can we say about groups? I, I think it's, you're on not very solid ground, given the Flynn effect, to talk about differences between African Americans and European Americans and Asian Americans, given the Flynn effect. And maybe that's a cop out. I think the answer will eventually emerge because the data will be there. You'll, you'll know the genetic variants. I think Steve's right. You'll eventually know them. If I could comment on the Flynn effect, my understanding is that over the period during which that's observed, the average years of education, saying Sweden yeah. went up dramatically. Yeah, also there's average it, heights it, went up dramatically. Yeah, yeah. That same height period. went so, up, and, and so the, the early group that you're comparing the modern group to would be in Turkheimer's underprivileged population. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because no modern people are su subjected to environments like that where they only go to school for four years and then they're out. 
Yeah. So it, the, I think the Flynn effect is a bit of a red herring in all this. You have to analyze it much more carefully before you. you, know, you I, I don't think the I wouldn't. I think educational opportunities accounts for a good chunk of the Flynn effect. Opinion. This is my opinion, Steve. I don't. If you ask me what the data is, I don't think that's all of it, though. I think that people live in in a much more complicated environment socially, technically today than they did 40 or 50 years ago, and that has and it's it's pervasive. But I think we're reduced by the. But I think when we when we talk about high heritability of intelligence in a modern yeah. setting, you're talking about people who have very yeah. good environments. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. Say you're in the upper fifty percent or thirty percent environment for mm -hmm. an North American. Yeah. I think everybody would agree the heritability is quite high. Yeah. And, and I should comment that the, the twin studies are not the only, uh, or adoption studies are not yeah. the only way to get at that. There's a yeah. whole modern set of techniques now which. Yeah. Which uh, are quite familiar pointed out the GCTA right. things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two comments uh, on what's been said. One on the, the, the goal order and policy. I think you were just flat out wrong because it does tell us about dynastic policy effects. The glasses that you're wearing can solve your very heritable myopia, but we're going to have to pay for glasses for your kids too. Mm -hmm. if, we could, if it was environmental and we fixed your myopia and you transmitted, therefore it was cultural and you mm -hmm. transmitted to your kids, we've saved. I mean, the, mo the economics of that is different. Uh, because because the, you expect the, the environmentally influenced one to be passed on to, the, to have benefits dynastically, and if it's if it's one hundred percent heritable, you can fix it with eyeglasses, but you can but you're going to have to fix it again with the kid with that person's kids. Um, the second thing that Turkheimer that a lot of people want to interpret that we should aim for one hundred percent heritability of opportunity, and that's the, that's true meritocracy. But um, the Turkheimer, I mean, at least the evidence, the empirical evidence is based on the twin correlations where there's three parameters, and we don't know the variance distribution of those three parameters. Um, we only know their relative. What are uh, the three, just the three parameters then? Sorry? Which, which three parameters? A, C, E. Oh, A, C, and E, okay, and okay. I'm, I'm, I'm saying now, uh, and then in one of the papers I submitted uh -huh. before this, since we have this actual measure of, of the genome, and we can actually plot um, a distribution yeah. of a single genetic risk score, we can look for subgroups, because one possibility is that for poor kids, the, the genetic variance is different than for rich kids. There's nothing, and that you would get a different heritability estimate for that. Oh, I now see your point, yeah. We can actually finally yeah. look yeah. at that okay. directly and ask that question. It does not appear to yeah. be. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's an important point. I, I, I get I your point. I didn't hear you said about yeah. quality of opportunity. There's been, I'm forgetting that there's a guy in the UK, David, you remember the name, People who've been arguing that um, that instead of mobility rates, if you want to talk about meritocracy or equal opportunity, the, the proper metric is heritability. Higher heritability means more. What, what Matt yeah. is saying, more equal opportunity to express your God or DNA. DNA yeah, your talents. Yeah. 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 That's absolutely, and the entire philosophy literature and defining equality of opportunity would have said the opposite, zero. Well, you look at it this way. The, the heritability of, of many chronic diseases at the turn of the century was probably pretty low because wh how long you lived depended upon things like infections and, and all these other things. And over the course of 100 years, medicine has got better. So genetics has become more important to chronic disease than it was at the, at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century. I would agree if, if you maximize heritability. That's, Regimes that do that, it, you could, I think you could make an argument that it's a meritocratic regime. You, you, you might not like it, we might not like it, but I think it, it makes sense. 